I want to tell you about an old cantankerous friend of mine named Fred. Well, actually, it's not his real name, but he was a real person. And Fred was easy to dislike. I know he was religious. He did go to church. But he was very low on the agreeability scale. In fact, he alienated people. Was it his attitude, his religiosity, his self-righteousness, his contentiousness? Imagine if you have to speak at the funeral and give credit to the man whose life you're celebrating. What a difficult and challenging task it is, because this man, Fred, wasn't the easiest man to like. And I even felt ill at ease with him to that degree. And I want to introduce you to him because in the end, it's nice to believe that everybody's a saint, that everybody, we all have virtues and we all have vices and we're all tarred with the same brush and maybe it's just good old human nature. But it does prompt a little bit of soul searching when you do meet people that surprise you. And the question that we can look is, is how do people regard you? How do you see yourself and how do you hope that others perceive you? Well, it's very easy to put up a facade to give people an impression of who you'd like to be. And in this narcissistic world of selfies and and TikTok and Instagram and all these kinds of modern phenomena where the self is elevated in just the right light and just the right picture and just the right mood... And so we're very conscious in how we look like and what we look like and, and where we are in life. But the question that I want to examine today is what does, how does God see you as opposed to how you see yourself or how you, your friends see you? So how does God see you? The transcendent, knowable, loving creator God who created humanity in his image and in his likeness, has a very strong vested image in who you are and what your identity is. Several places in the scripture, the author asks a question, and I'm quoting from Psalms 144, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you have an interest in him? In other words, if you're the great creator God, transcendent, eternal, invisible, omnipotent. What is it about us sinful creatures that attract your attention as a focus of your attention and your dedicated love to demonstrate your love for us by sending your son into this world to die and to pay our sins? So how does God see you? That's a very good question to ask because the psalmist goes on to say, man is like a breath. His days are like a passing shadow. And if you believe the evolutionary hypothesis, you and I are nothing more than a moment of consciousness between two oblivions. There's nothing good or bad, no evil, no light or dark. We're just an accident. But that's not true. There is a God who exists, who's knowable, who's almighty, who has a unique purpose. And I want to talk a little bit about that purpose and the survival of that purpose. Because that's crucial to you and me, knowing who we are, what our identity is, and then the threats to that identity, how you and I are threatened with total annihilation. But there's been a redemptive price, price paid for you and me, and it's a good story and it ends well. But have you ever wondered who you are, where you come from, what your origin is? Is there any meaning and purpose to life? And can you be certain about that? These are the big questions that all of us should ask. And why is human nature the way it is? If we remember my old cantankerous Fred, friend Fred. Difficult person to get on with. Challenging. And then there are degrees of evil and degrees of disagreeability. And, of course, the sceptic can say, well, why is there so much evil in this world? Well, there's a very clear and rational answer to that, and we'll explore that just now. And for those who are on the edge, on the cusp of faith, have you ever dared ask, is there any certain reason to believe in the transcendent, in the highest moral good epitomized in the word God, a knowable, personable, creator God, 
who's very, very interested in you and me and all of humanity. Let me explore this subject a little bit as we ask the question, what do you believe? What do I believe? And what is the transcendent reality that we can believe in? See, we were created in the image and likeness of God. That's humanity. And we were created sinless, but not immortal. God took dust from the ground and formed it into a man and breathed into him, and man became a living being. Sin entered the world through Adam and Eve. They were deceived by the temptation of God's adversary. And in Scripture, that adversary is known Satan the devil. Now, the devil is very clever. He was once an angel of light, and he's adept at transforming himself into an angel of light. So what he says and what he does and how he approaches you can on the surface seem very, very good and enticing. But he has one bent, and that bent is to deceive and to destroy humanity. That's all that he wants to do, and that's his purpose. And one day he will be destroyed in the lake of fire. Interesting story. Let's follow it through. As a result of Adam's sin, humanity became tainted by this virus, the virus of the spirit. And we became sinners by nature and by choice. So every day you and I make singular choices between that which is holy and right and true and that which is intrinsically and underlying evil and wrong. (coughs) As a result, the result of sin and brokenness It's total anathema from God. God is holy, righteous, pure and just. And the devil has infected this world with his thinking. Entitlement, lies, deceit, self-grandizement. And the reality for that is ultimate death and judgment. And those who are righteous, resurrection to life and salvation only through Jesus Christ. So... Let's go back to the very beginning. God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into the breath of life. And with Eve, he did something different. And the logical way of my personal thinking was God could have got another handful of dirt, formed it into woman, breathed into her, brought it together with Adam, and they would have become one. But God chose to cause Adam to fall into a deep, deep sleep. The very first surgery performed in the open pages of Genesis. God takes a rib from Adam, and from Adam, from the rib, forms a woman. Of course, Adam recognizes that she's come from him, and uh, he recognizes that this is a companion. God has created two now that can communicate. In fact, when God created us, God tells us that he spoke everything into existence. And then God creates us in his image and likeness, and we are gifted with the grace of speech, able and capable of communicating, communicating with one another, And, dare I say it, communicating with a knowable God, a transcendent knowable God. So being created in God's image and likeness means that humans are the pinnacle and the culmination of all God's creative desire. God has created us in his image and likeness. In other words, we can have a relationship. Well, you and I are relationship, relational creatures, Babies are born to need touch and eye contact. You deprive a baby of eye contact and touch, and you are introducing them to a life of suffering and mental illness. That's how important relationship is. And not only do we have relationship with one another, but God used to come in the Garden of Eden and talk to the people at the cool of the day. John in his epistle says, we have fellowship with one another And the reality of that fellowship is mirrored in our fellowship with our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is like a family. God is our Father, Jesus Christ, our elder brother, and our Lord, and the firstborn of many brethren. So what God is doing and began by creating humans in His image and likeness is absolutely remarkable. And you and I have been born and with a creative genius that God saw that everything that he made was very good. Perfect, beauty, harmony, fellowship, love, paradise on earth. And God created us with essentially what I would call 
unlimited potentiality. Created in the image and likeness of God, made lower than the angels with a vibrant and exciting future. That was God's purpose prior to the devil entering the Garden of Eden. And so this level of fellowship, heaven and earth intersecting, must have been some of the most beautiful, pristine moments ever experienced in the material universe as we understand it. To enjoy fellowship with God and by extension fellowship with one another in really what was an earthly paradise. But this paradise was soon interrupted by a slithering snake, the serpent, the devil, Satan, the devil in disguise. And let me state from the beginning that the devil's intent was to destroy everything that God had made. First to deceive it, and then to create the process of inherent weakness, fallibility, and destruction from within. And his focus of his destruction were you and me, created in God's image and likeness. In other words, he wanted to destroy the work of God. And people ask the question, why is there so much evil in the world? Well, that's why there is so much evil in the world. There's a prince of the power of the air, the devil, that still reigns in limited form. And so if you look at the fruit of the devil, or what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said of the devil, he is and his hordes of angels beyond redemption. There's no good in the devil. There's no light in the devil. There's no redemptive capability or promise of any kind. In John 8, 44, Jesus addresses this. He was talking to the religious leaders of the day, the Jewish religious leaders, posing as the absolute bastions of truth and integrity and obedience and law and holiness. In fact, they were exactly the opposite. Jesus said of these imposters, You are of the father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. There was Jesus, holy, righteous, pure and true, known for his good works and his good words. And all they wanted to do was kill him. As somebody mentioned to me today, they chose Barabbas over Jesus, not because they liked Barabbas, but because they hated the truth. They welcomed the lie. And where did that lie come from? It came from the devil. Speaking of the devil, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When the devil speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. And John tells us in his epistle, you're either children of God or in the darkness you are children of the devil. There's no in-between. John, Everything is very black and white with John. John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And he takes us in his gospel right to the very heart of Jesus Christ, the Son of God and the Son of Man. And so Peter, in his first epistle, talks about suffering. He talks about suffering for righteousness' sake in the words of Jesus. And he says in chapter 5, verse 8, Be sober-minded, be watchful. And why would Peter say that? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil prowls around. He gives you the impression that he's a roaring lion. And if you let him, he will whisper in your ears words of deception. That's the way the devil works. And so the devil's number one asset, the number one tactic that he has is deception. Remember the disciples in, in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 when they asked Jesus, what's going to happen in the end? What's the signs of the end and of your coming? And Jesus says, take heed that no one leads you astray, or as another translation says, that no one deceive you. If it were possible, says Jesus, even the elect would be deceived. That's the nature of the deception prior to Jesus Christ's return. So in that Garden of Eden, Satan lied to the woman. He said, you shall not surely die, for God knows when you eat of the fruit. You'll become like God, knowing good and evil. So in that sentence, Satan accuses God of being a bit of good and a bit of evil. You can't trust there's another agenda. Yet the Apostle John in his epistle says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. So you have the testimony of the devil versus the testimony of a man of God. Totally opposite when it speaks of the truth and the holiness and the righteousness of God. And um, 
And when what God said to Adam and Eve, if you take off this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall surely die. For dust you were taken and dust you shall return. And God knew, was God taking a risk? Or well, God was not taking a risk. He wanted humanity to grow up in an adversarial environment, to be victors amidst strife, to overcome and grow, so that God was not replicating billions and billions of more devils. That's why God made us out of the dust of the ground. And Jesus said, fear him, speaking of God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. God has an absolute sovereign authority, but he does allow the devil to do a certain work on his behalf, to tempt us, to test us, to try us, to sow discord. And if we're awake to that, Scripture says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have one stray thought that comes into your mind. Where does it come from? It doesn't match the Scripture. It doesn't match the words of Jesus. It doesn't match the holiness of God. It's come from the devil. Don't allow that seed to take root. Call out in the name of Jesus and dismiss that thought completely. What does Paul say? To bring every thought into the obedience and captivity of Jesus Christ. We were given the capacity to speak just like God so we can communicate. I'm speaking now to this camera. And then Jesus tells us of the responsibility that we have with our words. For men will be judged by every idle word they speak. And all of us are guilty of that judgment. The loose mouth and loose words at inopportune times and how many people that we've hurt. So for Eve, on that fateful day, the fruit looked good. It looked good, pleasant, good for food. And it looked like to make one wise. The devil had sown the seed of doubt and discontent and the capacity to take another path, an independent path, a path outside of God's instructions. And so Eve ate and Adam ate and innocence was gone. And that's what we refer to the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. So Paul later on writes to those in Rome and in Romans 5 verse 12 he says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Just like this virus through this pandemic, no one's been immune to it. Whether you've been vaccinated or unvaccinated, we've all suffered the illness of a temperature for two or three days. Um, and that's the nature of sin. We've all been tainted. One drop of poison in a glass of water destroys the whole integrity and the purity of that glass of water. And that's the way sin is. Break one point of the law, you're condemned by all the law. And so what this one act of disobedience caused that human nature to go into a downward spiral. And that's affected you and me. Paul wrote to those in Galatia, chapter 3, verse 22, But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that by the promise, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. There was a promise that one day the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head. A prophecy to, about the Messiah. And God has a purpose and a plan manifest in his son, Jesus Christ, who, incidentally, spoke everything into existence, sustains it by the word of his power, divested himself of his former glory, entered our world to become Jesus Christ, the incarnate son of God and the son of man, as symbolized by the a year old lamb, male without blemish, that was sacrificed every Passover, now no longer substitutionary. Jesus loves you and is prepared and was prepared to give up his life that you may live, that I may live. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You and I are mortal now, formed out of the dust of the ground. But on the day of righteous resurrection, you'll be raised to life to be just like Jesus, even as he is. That's a glorious, wonderful thought. Our destiny, that's why the devil wants to destroy us, because he knows we are offered, through suffering, privilege and honour and glory, something that he, would, he longed for, wanted to wrestle of God, but ultimately it won't be us who will be destroyed, it'll be the devil himself and all his angels. So this nature of human nature, we talk about human nature. My old friend... 
typical human nature, irascible, selfish. You know, you can also look at children. A family can have the ideal environment. Politeness, kindness, gentleness, sharing, prayer, tenderness, lots of love. But as the children play, all of a sudden one will steal the other one's toy. The other one will be frustrated and hit the other one over the head. And the parents can be absolutely shocked, saying, this has been a pristine environment. How did this aggression and selfishness and anger and strife, where did it come from? It's called human nature. The Lord said to Cain, Adam and Eve's son, sin is crouching at the door, but you must overcome it. And so we see in the world the sin and the calamity of Cain, rebellious, vic play the victim, pl place the blame elsewhere, angry, murderous, lying. Where does that come from? The devil's seed was sown with Adam and Eve. And the fruit has being begun to be born in that first generation. So, you know, the idea of this shame that Adam and Eve experienced and what they then saw was a flaming sword preventing them from going to the tree of life, symbolically living forever. And so, is this the end of the story? The devil's success in thwarting God's plan? Isaiah laments that. Isaiah was a prophet. And he wrote enormous book that we are privy to. And Isaiah 59 too, God says, But your iniquities have made a se separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear. So therefore the skeptic says, Well, I prayed to God and I yelled out at him. And he didn't hear my prayer. Why didn't God hear his prayer? because his attitude. I challenge every skeptic and every atheist, indeed every agnostic, if you don't believe God exists, do something and take up this challenge. Find a private place, place where nobody knows you, where you are and what you are doing. And don't yell at God and hurl abuse. Just say, God, if you exist, show yourself to me in an indisputable, clear, clarion way that I know that you exist. Do it in a spirit of fraternity, with great respect, and then walk away. And if you like, forget about it. And you will find circumstances in your life that are absolutely irrefutable, because God hears the humble prayer, even of sinners. When they come before God and say, God, if you exist, show yourself to me. So, But this is not the end of the story, because what I'm saying, and what we reveal from Scripture, that the, the nature of the work of the devil is very, very limited for those called to God and given his Holy Spirit. We have victory over sin and death only through Jesus Christ. See, there's a redemption story in the scripture. Through sin, we were sold to the devil. And our end result is anathema from God and total annihilation and destruction. But the barrier that separated us from God was brought down by the Lord Jesus Christ. When Jesus died on that cross, the veil in that great temple in Jerusalem was torn from the top of the bottom, top to bottom, rendered completely torn, so that everybody could see into the Holy of Holies, which was only accessible by the high priest once a year. So therefore, now we can come before the throne of grace, not just symbolically, but in reality, to pray to our Father in heaven and find mercy and help in time of need. And only because of great mercy... God's love for us is the restoration of fellowship. Can I let you know that there are no limits to God's mercy when it concerns you and me? God is love, and he will do what it takes to redeem us. Do you know the story of Abraham and Isaac where God said, Take your son, your only son, whom you love, and take him to the land of Moriah and offer him as a sacrifice? And we could say, Well, what a cruel, horrible God. In fact, God is telling us his own story because we identify with the relationship between husband and wife and father and son. And God is taking, telling Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love. And we know that the father loves the son and Jesus Christ loves his father. That story was all about the ram with its thick horns caught in a thicket. 
And God was telling us a, a story that would point directly to the Messiah. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Romans 3, 22, verse 23. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. None of us with the devil in the picture have any hope, any redemptive reality of any kind. You might think you've led a nice life. You might think that you've basically been a good person. Not in God's eyes. God knows your heart. But the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, that you look to your Saviour and not to the devil. You don't look to yourself. You look to God and ask him for mercy and help. And God being just and holy and righteous, the law condemns us to death. And so God is bound by his sovereignty to dish out punishment for the offence. And that's exactly what he did through the death and the suffering of Jesus Christ, who was holy, pure, never sinned. Jesus took on himself because he was the son of God in character and in nature, divested himself of his former glory, the only one who could pay that penalty and absorbs all of sinful humanity's misdeeds into himself. And that's exactly what he did. So, the Apostle Paul takes us on a journey in Romans 5, discussing the curse of sin. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, in verse 12, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all have sinned. In verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, there is coming a time when death will exist no more, because in Jesus' suffering and death, he swallowed up death in victory. That's to use biblical language. And so Paul wrote to those in Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, 54. When the perishable, that's you and me, formed out of the dust on the ground, puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come, pass, pass the, then shall come to pass that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So to be, to live purely on a physical carnal level is a direct trajectory to death. But to be spiritually minded is to be promised life and peace and life forevermore. And so we're encouraged. Don't seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And God says, I'll provide food, clothing and shelter for you. Jesus made that quite explicit. So there's always a wrestle. The, eye, the pride of life, the desire of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pull of the world, the deception of the devil is there. And as God said to Cain, you must overcome it. In Revelation, he says, to those who overcome, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. No angel sits on Jesus' throne, but you and I are invited to sit on his throne. So this is not just small talk, insidiously not worth the moment of day. This concerns your life, your identity, who we are as humans. And so those who live, listen to Romans 8 verse 5, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh as contrasted to those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. In other words, Jesus Christ gives life and we express faith in that transcendent reality. Whereas sin, originating from the devil, gives death. Nothing else. And Satan's work today is accuses of the brethren. Scripture says Satan accuses the brethren. That's why Jesus is our high priest in heaven interceding for us. So the Heavenly Father doesn't only listen to the devil's accusations, see that John did that again, but Jesus as our high priest intercedes for us. So the battle of the greater cosmic conversation continues every day and every moment. We know that the devil deceives the whole world. And the whole world, in media, education, politics, and the broader society's narrative, is deceptive. And it comes from the devil. So as part of the narrative that children learn in primary school, that there is no God. We evolved through random happenstance. There's no morality. But that's a lie. 
Even the devil says, I don't even exist. There's no such thing as any of the spiritual. But there is, brothers and sisters. And you and I know that, understand that. And we also under know that he is, the devil is active in this world and in every part of the world. And as accuser, you remember the story in Job where, where Satan comes before God in this epic great story, this ancient story, and says, well, Job is only likes you and obeys you and follows you because you bless him and you look after him and you protect him and he, you cherish him and you know who he is. So the devil accused Job as just being cheap, surface deep. And we follow that story. Job faced a war, a battle for his life. It's an epic book. All of us who follow Christ, Scripture says, will perse be persecuted, will suffer to some degree. Blessed are you, says Jesus, when you're persecuted for righteousness. But we also know that in Christ we have strength. Of ourselves, we cannot resist the devil. He's too clever for us. He's in every dark corner. But in Christ, we can have the strength by the power of the Spirit and the Word of God to resist the devil. Of course, the when the dragon, as Revelation says, knows that his time is short, he gets angry, very violent. Many times when a criminal is arrested, I feel for those police or arresting officers because violence ensues. We read from Revelation 12. Then the dragon became furious with the woman. The symbolism there is the dragon is Satan and the woman represents the church and went off to make the war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. And sadly today, most people who live, breathe, walk and talk don't know their identity. They're prisoners prisoners of, and slaves of sin and death, ultimately under the guise of Satan and his deception. Of course, the message is out there. Repent, change your life, seek God, know who you are, and put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But the reality is, we have victory in Jesus Christ. It's Satan, the devil, who loses out and will be destroyed. We read in Scripture where he's bound for a thousand years at Christ's return. Jesus and the saints reigns on the earth. At the end of a thousand years, Satan is released for a short period of time, a hundred or so years, to deceive the nations. He's back to his old game. And then after that, when Satan's destroyed, even death is destroyed. So if we do a, a, a bit of a synopsis of the last few minutes that we've been destroying, exploring this subject, fellowship with God that was lost in the Garden of Eden will become fellowship universally regained. The prophets of Scripture said, One day every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. And Jesus will reign until every adversary is put under him, destroyed. And when everything is under Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will submit all to the Heavenly Father. And then we learn from Scripture that God will become all in all remarkable promise of victory over suffering, enslavement and death. All because of the Lord Jesus Christ. All because of our Father's love. All because we are the crowning jewel of everything that God spoke into existence. We are going to be redeemed and reign with the Lord forever and ever. That's why Jesus looks at you today and says, Come to me. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest, physical rest, spiritual rest and peace, and release from the guilt of sin and death. He says, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. In other words, the very image bearers of God as we are in the flesh will pour out His Spirit, His presence in everything you say, in everything you do, in all that you are. No wonder Paul wrote, whatever you do in word or deed, everything we say, everything we do, do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You and I have extraordinary potential, but there's been an extraordinary war fought over us. 
To he who overcomes, says Jesus, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. Even as I overcame, said Jesus, suffered, bled and died, and now sat down on my Father's throne. Nobody sits on the throne, on the throne of God except God the Father. And now Jesus sits on the throne with his Father. Are we willing to turn our eyes to Jesus Christ and confess our sin and receive him and believe in him and be granted the tree of life, the Holy Spirit, children of God to live forever? See, Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. The fog of deception caused so many people to be lost at sea, metaphorically speaking. In that fog of blind deception, Jesus is that shining light beckoning us to come to him. We have work to do in the interim. Those of us of the light, those of us redeemed and saved and given the right hand of fellowship with God the Father and Jesus Christ, we now have a testimony, a testimony of grace, a testimony of truth, a testimony of redemption, a testimony of liberty and freedom to live godly lives, to resist the devil and to love others as we've been loved. Uh, when I began this message, I introduced you briefly to my old-time cantankerous friend, Fred, the man that I once knew many, many years ago. He was, I suppose, the personification of human nature with all its limitations and its flaws. How do I see that man today? How do you see those people that you've known on a similar calibre, very low on the agreeability scale? You know, his problem, we call it human nature, is not just his problem, it's my problem, it's our shared problem, and it's called human nature. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And shortly after birth, human nature becomes evident. It inclines us to passions, desires, lusts, bursts of anger, malevolence, whatever seems right to a man. But Scripture says there's a way that seems right to a man, but the way thereof is death. The devil disguises, tries to destroy marriage today and makes sex as a commodity to be bought and sold. And people are having sex, sinning without the love that they seek, fleeting pleasures where the devil is woven into the very fabric of society that sanctions wrong sexuality. The greatest battle that we ever have to overcome is human nature. But as we become baptized and we come out of the waters of baptism, hands laid on us, Scripture tells us that we become a new creation. We can't overcome our old selves by ourselves. It's the redemptive nature of Christ and the indwelling and the calling of the Holy Spirit by the Father that begins this transformative process. And I know and I love Spending time with brothers and sisters in Christ who have also become a new creation. How do you know the Holy Spirit is in their life? Love. You witness joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. Characterize a person in Christ. And so we live a holy, pure righteous life and there's a responsibility that comes with the great promises and the great redemption that's given to us jesus says by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another and then he says no greater love has man than this then he lay down his life for his friends which jesus did for us if you know how much you've been loved then you and i have a responsibility to reach out and love others even as we've been loved in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm your brother, John Classic.